and welcome to another live on UK Low Carb. I am really excited about this live because, uh, you know, when you read a book and it just has such a big impact on you and it just tells you so much about, you know, things you're interested in, then you get to meet the author and he's also pretty awesome as well and you meet him in a moment. So this, this episode today, this podcast and also YouTube, which is going around the whole world and also on Facebook and different groups up and down the country, uh, in the States, in South Africa, all over the place. Uh, and today I am talking to Sam Apple. He is the author of Ravenous, and that's the story of Otto Warburg, The Nazis and the Search for the Cancer Diet Connection. And before I just hand over and say hello to Sam, I just want to say this. Sam's a great author. And the reason I say that is because he, just like all great authors, he takes really really kind of quite tough subjects and concepts and he makes them accessible and i think in all honesty that his work puts him sort of proudly alongside gary torbs and nina tyshaltz as kind of a great author in the metabolic science space so i'd like to say a massive welcome to you sam apple to uk low carb thank you i'm really happy to be here and uh it's incredibly nice of you to say you know gary and nina certainly inspirations for me so it's it's a real honor to be in that company well, I think you put yourself there. It's nothing to do with me, but um, thank you so much. And it has been really, really interesting reading your book, by the way, Ravenous. So just to go back a little bit, uh, what happened is uh, in June, I think it was, uh, Professor Tim Notes came onto the show. He then said uh, he recommended the book Ravenous. He said, I just started reading this book. It's just been released. It's a really, really good book. I recommend it. He then came back on to the big conversation a few weeks later in July. He also said again about this book. So I thought, well, I, you know, if Tim Noakes tells you to read something, you really should. Um, and I did. And I was just blown away by your book. So um, I think it's important to start really with a story. So who was Otto Warburg? Now, obviously, I've read the book, I know. But for anyone who hasn't, I want them to understand who he was. And also, I think the most important question is, why is he so remarkable and what he discovered? Sure. So Otto Warburg was a, a German scientist who was born in the late 19th century, did most of his work in the 20th century. And he grew up in a really unusual household. His father was a very well-known and respected physicist, one of the most important physicists in Germany, very close with Einstein. Einstein really loved his father. And uh, his father he was friends with Max Planck and Fritz Haber and all these greats of German science. And so Warburg grows up in this household where, you know, the people who are coming in and out of the house are, you know, perhaps the greatest scientists in history. And um, he has tremendous self-confidence, extraordinary self-confidence. Funny <laughs> way much. of saying that, because yeah. I'd say to the point of narcissism. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. He's, he's, He's an interesting individual. I, I, I think I'd hazard a guess here, Sam, that you and I probably wouldn't get on with him in a personal level if we met him, right? Well, I think that's mostly true, although, you know, part of what allowed me to, to write this book is that things that probably should have annoyed me, I couldn't help be amused by. Uh, I mean, there's just <laughs> so many, you know, outrageous stories. You know, one of my favorites is when he finally wins the Nobel Prize, his first response is, it's about time. Uh, yeah, you know, he, yeah, I love uh, that. So, um, so he grows up thinking, you know, of course I'm going to be the next great world-changing scientist. These are all the people that I know. He said he pitied everybody that didn't spend their life devoted to science. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so sure enough, he, um, you know, he continues to, to study science. His father is a physicist. His, his big rebellion was sort of moving into biology, into the living world, but he still always thought about biology through the lens of physics and energy. Um, and he ends up making, you know, extraordinary discoveries in, in multiple different fields. A lot of people believe he should have won the Nobel Prize three times. But, um, you know, the discovery that, that I focus on and that, um, you know, really changed our understanding of cancer forever uh, was made in 1923. And that's when He's studying cancer and discovers that cancer cells actually consume nutrients in a very different way from other cells. Uh, you know, a typical cell that, that's not growing rapidly like a cancer cell will take up the glucose that's in the blood and break it down with oxygen in the mitochondria, these power plants. Uh, but Warburg, and Warburg thought that cancer cells would do this too. He thought they might even do it more than other cells because cancers need a lot of energy and they need to grow. But instead, the cancer cells he studied were, were doing something very different. They were taking up even more glucose, but not breaking it down in the mitochondria. They were using what I call the backup generator, you know, taking the glucose, 
splitting it in two, turning it into lactic acid and, you know, sending it out of the cell. It's fermentation. It's the exact same process, you know, that we, uh, you know, understand from microorganisms and yeast, et cetera. It gives us beer and wine and bread and cheese and yogurt. So this, this cancer cells do the same thing. And, um, you know, it's an extraordinary discovery. And, you know, to this day, scientists are trying to understand how it happens, why cancer cells do it. And, and that's, you know, a critical part of my book. Yeah, which I found really fascinating. So, okay, there's, there's so much we can go into there. I'm just going to ask firstly, um, it seems to be that science would be a perfect thing if it wasn't for human beings. And they, they bring their preconceptions into science, don't they? And one of the things I thought was really interesting is how you described looking, I think it's Pasteur, looking at organisms that are moving away from the oxygen rather than towards it. And actually, um, wasn't it the case that Warburg believed that oxygen was the purest form of energy? Like you said, cancer would need more of it. So why were these ravenously eating sugar to ferment instead? Um, and isn't it interesting, he kind of came with the idea of the oxygen being the preferred route and actually it was turned on its head, wasn't it? Um, so I was going to ask about that kind of preconception he came from, really. And, and yeah. secondly, to put him in the context of where he comes from, because I used to teach history, so I know quite a bit about Pasteur and Koch and some of the different discoveries made in the 19th century. And he's kind of coming at the tail end of this and a lot of the preconceived ideas from the 19th century science, isn't he? Yeah, no, absolutely. So he had a library and uh, he put a portrait of, Pasteur directly across from where he sat and looked at it all day, and then one of Koch right on the side, and another of Paul Ehrlich. Uh, so these were his heroes, but they were his heroes because they had changed the world. You know, that's what he wanted to do. They had done it in the realm of microbiology, you know, studying infectious diseases, and a lot of that had been figured out by the time he comes onto the scene. And he wants to make the next great discovery. So the question is where he's going to do it. And he decided it to focus on cancer, not because he had a personal connection to cancer, but because it was a disease that had really captured the German imagination at that time. Uh, you know, all these infectious diseases had, you know, been terrible plagues in the 19th century, but, you know, they had started to understand how to prevent them and to identify the specific microorganisms responsible. The cancer remained largely mysterious and it was growing more and more common and the Germans, you know, were mystified. It was the disease they couldn't conquer. And, uh, you know, now we're used to these horrific cancer rates every year, but it really wasn't that way in the middle of the 19th century. And it just became more and more. So it felt almost like a pandemic, you know, cancer was suddenly growing more and more common. And, you know, just as a side note, I, I do think, you know, it would help all of us to think of cancer in this way with more urgency because, you know, we're, we're used to these, you know, extraordinary cancer rates, but it wasn't always that way. Which I think actually puts it into a really good context of, you know, if we had lifespans of 200 years, we'd, we'd see that, wouldn't we? But because we kind of get used to this condition, it almost seems like it's part of old age. But actually, yeah. this is what I thought was really interesting. Your book starts with looking at, well, because there's a story here, and I, I shared this with you previously by email. I was out with some oncologists and I talked about Warburg and they had never heard of him before. And when I said, did you realize that cancer and the whole field of oncology has really developed in the last kind of 60, 70 years or so, they were like, yeah, because cancer wasn't detected before. But you actually start off by saying that's not true, is it? There were tribes who they were studying. And there are examples, I think, of Japanese women who had left Japan and suddenly they have cases of cancer, which they didn't have previously in Japan, their the family they left behind. There's definitely an increase which suddenly shot up. And of course, people, up, I think we know why, but a lot of people didn't know why that was happening. They, they were terrified by it, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I originally wanted to call my book A Disease of Civilization uh, because that, that's really the core story is what made cancer so much more common in the modern world. And, and to, to tell that story, you first have to establish that it really did become more common because a lot of people, you know, sort of reflexively think, oh, that's, that's a silly question. It's more common because people live longer lives. So I just spend like a chapter sort of making that argument. And, you know, I think the evidence is overwhelming that um, it's not, you know, certainly living longer lives is, makes cancer more common because it does, you know, become much more likely as you age, but it's not the whole story by any means. People have been living to, you know, the 50s and beyond for, you know, thousands of years and many different societies and, and in the late 
you know, 19th century and early 20th century, you have very sophisticated doctors, you know, going to all sorts of communities all over the world and being astonished that, you know, there was virtually no cancer in some of these communities. You know, these are communities that didn't follow the modern Western lifestyle. So I think it's very clear that cancer should be thought of as a disease of civilization, much like diabetes and, and cardiovascular disease and, and obesity to some extent. Uh, and, and the question is why? What is it about modern Western living and eating that, that causes it? It's not an easy question. And, you know, we've been trying to figure this out for a hundred years. And my book at the end is, is to try to put the emphasis on a new explanation, not that any one thing can explain it. Of course, there's smoking and sun exposure and so on. But I think we may have missed, largely missed the biggest issue of all, which I'm sure we'll talk about more. Yeah, which is what I want to come on to today. So, okay, let, the thing that stood out for me in the book when I was reading it was uh, you've got the story of the individual, which I think is a huge part of why science went to a certain route that it did. You've also got the, the individual's position in history, the fact that we're talking about Germany. 1923, of course, is a massively turbulent year in Germany with the Munich Putsch and all the rest of it and the financial problems in Germany, hyperinflation. And actually his story goes alongside the story of the Nazis as well, which I find an incredible kind of parallel with, you know, the fact these lives are going alongside each other. Now, for those people who don't know, uh, Warburg himself was Jewish, according to the Nazi charts as to what a Jewish person was. He's also uh, a gay man as well who lived with his partner. And yet, actually, he somehow, I think probably the only person I know of, uh, did OK in Nazi Germany, was protected, even had very high ranking meetings, uh, as, as suggested by your book, authorized by uh, Hitler himself, by the looks of things, from what you've, you've pieced together. So I want to go into all of that story um, to find out about, a bit more about this man and how he was doing his science and how he managed to survive uh, that kind of really turbulent period in, I mean, a bit of an understatement, in German history. Um, I mean, just one thing I want to say, when the Russians crashed into his office, you know, he didn't sort of cower or anything. He stood up and said, yes, it is I, it's Warburg. I mean, what, what a character. Incredible. All these little stories that came up and I was like, is this guy for real? How did he survive the Holocaust? So uh, do you want to just put it into the context of how he managed to survive that period? That's a long question. If you can yeah, find yeah. an answer from all of that, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah. You know, in addition to being Jewish by Nazi definitions and being, I wouldn't say openly gay, but as open as one could be at the time, he also had the, you know, perhaps the most famous Jewish name in Germany. You know, his cousins are, are famous bankers. So he really had everything going against him. And, and to top it off, he was, you know, incredibly sort of outspoken and, you know, would shout at, you know, Nazis who came to his institute trying to get him to sign papers, kick them out of his institute. So he provoked them at every opportunity. Um, he really is, you know, miraculous that, that he survived or didn't. Um, he didn't leave when so many of his Jewish colleagues did. You know, he did have opportunities to leave and he stayed in part because he was just so arrogant that he, he couldn't fathom that somebody was going to tell him what to do. Someone was going to kick him out of this beautiful institute that had been built specifically for him by the Rockefeller Foundation, which is kind of brand crazy. new as well, right? Isn't yeah, it, brand new. Two years before. before yeah, it was built Nazi in 1931. Came. And um, right. so the Nazis come to power in 1933. And, you know, Warburg won't budge, basically. Uh, you know, one line he had was, it's easy for, you know, somebody to find an inst another institute in another country, but it's hard for a king to find a new kingdom. You know, that's, that's how he thought of himself. Um, so he, he continues to work, and, and he is harassed by the Nazis at various points. But um, in the first years, you know, things aren't as bad in the early 30s, of course. And he had served in World War One, and that that still mattered a little bit in 1933. Um, By the way, he was in the Prussian cavalry, right? Which is like the elite regiment where the aristocrats go. So he's a well-connected guy who I think you can describe it as being obnoxiously like arrogant about his position in the First World War. And you went into all of that. I feel like I knew the guy afterwards. He was a very uh, well-connected, well-established man in that way, wasn't he? In German yeah. society. Yeah, and he and he loved. I mean, he was a true German patriot, and and he loved serving in the military in World War One and being aristocratic. And then he came back and ran his institute like a military outfit. Um, and that's really why it was so shocking for for so many of these Jewish scientists in 1933. They were great patriots. You know, Fritz Haber goes, you know, leaves the country, and he's just mystified. You know, I was a hero in World War One. How could they do this to me? Yeah. So you know, Warburg, you know 
you know, he, he had another line. He said, I was here before Hitler. You know, who was Hitler to come in and tell him that he wasn't a true German? I mean, it was truly, you know, incomprehensible for Warburg and many others. So he stays and, you know, a, as things progress, his situation becomes more and more precarious. And um, it's clear by the late thirties that he's sort of missed his opportunity to leave. And I think he understands it and starts to understand that there's actually some value for the Nazis and having him there, they're able to say, you know, in 19, late 1930s, we still have this one, you know, partially Jewish scientist. Um, uh, so it, uh, it really comes to a head in, in 1941 because, you know, at this point, the the war you know has, has started the warburg no longer has any sort of propaganda value no longer really has any value to the nazis at this point it seems and he has a lot of enemies you know people that hated him because he was jewish and because they, they probably hated him anyways because he had so many enemies in, in science um so they they get him evicted from his institute and it looks like it's the beginning of the end for him and uh, he's called into Nazi headquarters, you know, the Reich Chancellery. And one of the Nazis he meets with, Victor Brock, who is, you know, one of the architects of the euthanasia program, you know, one of the worst, you know, worst people in, in human history. And um, that day he meets with Himmler and has a meeting about Warburg. And then Warburg comes in and they sit him down and, and tell him that, he's going to be allowed to live so long as he continues to focus on cancer. And it's a pretty extraordinary thing. And, and that um, was the story I knew when I started the book. And it actually was only partially partway through my research where it sort of dawned on me, like, wait a minute, June 21st, 1941. Like, why do I know that date? And, yeah. and I, I realized, that, the yeah, yeah. I realized the you know, Warburg, all this stuff that was going on with Warburg at Nazi headquarters took place only hours before you know the german takes roll eastward and launch operation barbarossa which you know is the biggest military operation in history at the time and it just you know boggles the mind that, that they're dealing with warburg hours before this and then you see in Goebbels diary later that night he and hitler are actually talking about cancer like even like you know an hour or two before operation which is Barbara. mind blowing like you say you just think the biggest operation in the world it's also the turning point for the whole of the second world war it's going to be not that they knew this, it's going to be the beginnings of the end of the Third Reich, or as they thought it, they're going to take over the living space that was the, you know, the Eastern Front and and kind of expand forever. And yet there they are talking about this man who they're now protecting, a, you know, a Jewish gay man uh, who they're trying to protect for the sake of cancer. And that's what they're concerned with, which tells you how much at the forefront of their minds cancer must have been. I mean, it yeah. must have been really top priority for these guys yeah I and mean, it was for many of them but you know certainly hitler first and foremost and you know that's why i included some of hitler's biography in, in this book as well because you know i hadn't fully appreciated until i started to research just how fundamental cancer was to his thinking uh you know there are many yeah. explanations but most important of all was that you know he lost his mother to breast cancer and was, was there by her side as she was dying and you know, the, it was actually a Jewish doctor that was caring for her. And, you know, he described, he, he said he had never seen somebody so forlorn in his entire life as Hitler as he sat by his mother's side. And, you know, s historians say his mother was the only person he was even capable of loving. So it formed sort of a, uh, a fundamental sort of a place in his psyche, I think. Uh, and he became, you know, an incredible hypochondriac and had many things he feared, but, but cancer was always at the top of the list. He had these horrible stomach cramps. And so, you know, Warburg, in a sense, as someone who had already won a Nobel Prize and had made a tremendous discovery about cancer, you know, was in a very unusual place. You know, he had all these reasons for the Nazis to despise him and want him dead. And yet he possibly held, you know, the secret to a, a cure for cancer, which they valued as much as almost anything amazing amazing but also i think it was interesting how you kind of took germ theory from the 19th century views on cancer and how the nazis turned this into their grotesque disgusting uh, anti-semitism and of course they then use that as a justification for you know getting rid of disease in society is like getting rid of cancerous cells or get rid of germs it's just 
there's a whole psyche there, but it was almost like a religious fervor, wasn't it, the Nazis, of good and evil. And, of course, it's completely whacked up and wrong and evil in itself. But that kind of tied into it, which is why I think it's Warburg was saved by the fact he was doing this field in science. If he was doing anything else in science, even to such an amazing standard that he was in physics, for instance, uh, for sure the Nazis would have killed him, wouldn't they? Um, there's no way he'd have survived. Yeah, I think, it, you know... It's hard to know, but I think it was cancer. You know, they literally said, you know, you have to focus on cancer. So I don't think anything else would have saved him. And, you know, they even, as bombs started to fall near his institute in Berlin, they even relocated him, you know, later in the war at a time when everything was going to the military. You weren't allowed to use gasoline. And you know, meanwhile, they take time out to build him a new institute in that countryside. So wow. it, it's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, incredible. So let's talk about the Warburg effect then a bit more, if that's OK, because the other sure. thing I think is interesting is you've got the discoveries he's making during the 30s and 40s. But actually, the Warburg effect itself doesn't get coined until is it the 70s that they, they name this concept, the Warburg effect after him. So I want to talk about the research he was doing then and also what happened after the war and how is it that kind of this theory of the metabolic side of cancer kind of got dropped? Sure. So, you know, as I mentioned, Warburg's, you know, most important cancer discovery takes place in 1923. And the discovery is that, that cancer cells are not using oxygen to, to burn their nutrients or not using as much as you would think, and they're fermenting. And um, so there, there are many ways to think about this. One, you know, just in terms of therapy, you know, the immediate question arises is, can you somehow block this fermentation or can you starve the cancer cell of glucose? And we could talk about that as well. But, you know, the, the issue that was there from the beginning was really what's causing the, the shift of fermentation. And you mentioned Warburg was, you know, or you mentioned Pasteur before, and that was a huge influence on Warburg. Uh, Warburg uh, knew from Pasteur what he thought he knew was that there's a seesaw-like relationship as more respiration means less fermentation, less respiration means more fermentation. So if they were doing less respiration, Warburg, you know, assumed it had to be because, you know, something had gone wrong. They weren't able to use oxygen. He, you know, we talked about that Warburg was an aristocrat. He literally thought of this in aristocratic terms, like things that use oxygen are higher and things that ferment are lower. And um, so his explanation for the Warburg effect was always that somehow to break down in the mitochondria, somehow to inability to use oxygen and you know he spent much of his time theorizing about you know the cause and um that that was always controversial he had evidence from the beginning that he had discovered something hugely important but he never had great evidence for the why it, you know for why it was happening and, and so that remained a big debate into the 1940s and then you know the war starts and everything is sort of put aside and then when science you know starts to recover in the 1950s these scientists come along and say, well, wait a minute, we're, we're testing these cancer cells and they seem to be using oxygen. So they are fermenting, as you say, but they're also using oxygen. So your explanation must be wrong. And, and Warburg, you know, he could not accept for a second being wrong about anything. And so- well, can I ask you on that point? Because yeah, he actually yeah. invited, he is actually also uh, an expert in photosynthesis, wasn't he? Right. And so yeah. he actually invited scientists over from America to give them a massive lecture and even though they stood up and gave their own talk about how he was completely wrong and everything he just said wasn't correct, he was so smug and invited them for dinner, almost like he made his point, almost like he wasn't listening to the people. He yeah. was so convinced he was right that there was like, I presented it. So no matter what you say, I'm yeah. right, you're wrong. Yeah, Incredible. yeah, he gave, yeah, you know, in 1950, he gave a lecture to Nobel laureates and he showed his little chart about respiration and fermentation. So that's all you need to know about cancer. Everything else is garbage. Uh, so, you know, that, that's how he was. And so unfortunately, you know, he spent so many of his final years, you know, trying to defend his theory when, you know, I don't think that that even really mattered that much, you know, I mean, it, it matters, but, you know, what you want to know is that it's happening and is there a way to do something about it? The theoretical underpinnings are important, but, um, he, he got caught up in all these scientific views and there's a few poignant moments in his life where he realizes that he's wasted so much time arguing with other scientists when he could have been more focused on his research. So, 
that's in a way, you know, it was heartbreaking for me to see that he has these flashes of awareness because it'd be easier if he never sort of came out of his narcissistic bubble. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so, you know, what happens is he's, you know, a lot of people are saying he's wrong in the 1950s about the explanation. And the debate starts to drift away partially because people hate Warburg and they think that he may be collaborating with the Nazis, even though, you know, he didn't, he hated the Nazis. Um, and then, you know, in the fifties, we have the discovery of DNA and the structure of DNA. And, you know, by the 1970s, the molecular biology of cancer has taken over the stuff Warburg studying how cells break down glucose. It's like laughably outdated. It's old world biochemistry, you know, nothing to do with cancer. Uh, they talked about the enzymes as quote unquote housekeeping enzymes. And, um, you know, they understood that a cell, of course, needed energy, but it was like, okay, you know, as it's growing, sure, some enzymes respond by supplying nutrients, but it's not at the core of what cancer is. And, and so Warburg just disappears. Uh, it's amazing how quickly it happened, not mentioned in textbooks, you know, not mentioned in this 2000 paper on the hallmarks of cancer, not mentioned in, you know, The Emperor of All Maladies, this wonderful book about cancer. Um, it's just gone and it's amazing how rapidly it happens and how completely it happens. And then, you know, it's, it's rediscovered. And that's the last part of my book, this sort of rediscovery of Warburg and this synthesis of, of metabolism and molecular biology. You know, the, the really amazing part of this story is all these cancer genes, these oncogenes that uh, were the new understanding, you know, as the cause of cancer, you know, over, a period of 20, 30 years, the scientists who are working on this realize that the very same oncogenes are actually the ones that control metabolism and that, you know, the, the metabolic changes seem to be at the core of the process because, you know, if you try to, you know, it's just sort of intuitive. If you try to grow and make copies and copies of a cell, if you don't actually have the energy supply, you're not going to get very far. So you have to learn to be able to overeat nutrients before you can become a cancer. And that's sort of been a you know fundamental part of the rediscovery of Warburg. Fantastic. Um, before I kind of leave that period behind and go into his post-war career, because I think it is a really interesting one. Um, one of the things I didn't realize, but it kind of makes complete sense, is the fact you said that Hitler was, uh, in fact, a sugar addict, uh, which when you then describe his behavior makes sense, doesn't it? Because he was quite often meetings, having to leave quickly to go and get sweets. He said that sweets were the mainly thing that he needed to concentrate on what he was doing. Uh, he felt lethargic and wasn't himself when he wasn't eating sugar. He was—he had a serious sugar addiction, didn't he? Yeah, he did. I mean, I always want to be careful when I talk about that. Like, I, I don't by any means, you know, want to suggest that, that sugar is responsible for... Oh, just want to say his, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. He, was, yeah. he was evil. <laughs> so yeah. I that point. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, it, it may have contributed to some of his, you know, erratic behavior and mood swings, but, you know, he was, I think it was his psychotic behavior that led to a sugar addiction rather than the other way around. You know, he took everything yeah. to insane extremes, but it, it really was striking to, I, I don't know that I've ever read about a human being who was more addicted to sugar. You know, he was just stuffing his face with desserts and, um, you know, he was actually, you know, worried about his weight at various times. So by the end of his life, he was taking so many drugs that, you know, who knows what was going on with him met metabolically. Yeah, he, he seems like a right mess. Of course, towards the end, he, his health was completely failing, wasn't it? Um, but let's go into then this period of, of post-war. So there's, there's a really, I think, a very, very poignant moment where he is, I think, out to dinner in America. You talk about the fact that because of his English problems, you know, lectures were actually given by other people, but he was in the room. So, you know, as somebody said, Warburg believes that. He's like, what do you mean believe? I know it's true. You know, he was very, even yeah. in his lectures jumping in. Sorry, I'm a bit of a fanboy here because I, I, yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed it. Um, but, but also there's this moment where he's having uh, dinner, I think, with some friends or, you know, in, in the States. Uh, and somebody says, you, you describe it as like the emperor's got no clothes on moment. <laughs> Someone says, like, why did you stay? Well, do you want to explain the scene? Because I'm probably butchering this. Sure, uh, and I, sure. And I wonder if, the reason I ask this is, do you think this relates to, in some ways, why the scientific community were happy to move on from Warburg? Potentially one of the reasons his name was dropped was because he was almost, I know you said he isn't, but he's almost seen as being complicit with the Nazis, even though he was actually against them himself. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. So the scene you're referring to is, you know, a couple of years after the war and he's in the United States at some sort of faculty dinner 
and somebody, uh, uh, the wife of one of the scientists who he's, you know, at dinner with says to him, you know, well, why didn't you do more? Why didn't you, you know, protest? And, um, you know, Warburg says, you know, what, what could I have done? And her response is, you could have killed yourself, which is, you know, not, not a fair thing to say, but what struck me is that it was the only instance I could really find where somebody spoke to him directly. You know, everybody was afraid of him or speaking behind his back, but you know, this woman comes right to his face and says, you could have killed yourself. And it's, it's outrageous in a way. And, you know, I think, you know, I think readers might read that and feel that sympathetic towards Warburg, but I felt like, you know, he had it coming, like finally somebody called him out. Uh, you know, as much as I, I still like him as a character, you know, what I learned in the course of my research is that, you know, the stuff that I loved about him, the way he, you know, hated the Nazis and, you know, stood up to them and threw them out of his institute, you know, really wasn't driven, you know, by a humanistic streak. It was more driven by his narcissism. So, uh, you know, I just, after researching his life for years, I was like, okay, I'm glad somebody finally just said something to the guy. Um, but, didn't, um, to, didn't want to also protect his lab. Wasn't that the case as well? And unlike the staff in his lab, but, but I imagine they probably came if they're Jewish or they were deemed as being undesirable in Nazi Germany. They would have faced ultimately their own deaths as well, wouldn't they? Cause they would have, I imagine they would have stuck with Warburg and he survived and many of them probably didn't. Is that right? Yeah. Well, he had, um, one Jewish researcher in his lab that he really tried to hold on to and to protect. And, uh, you know, at first I thought it was his most, you know, admirable moment, you know, standing up for this guy, you know, at one point the Nazi officials harassed him about it. And he said, well, he's a Hungarian Jew. I didn't think it applied to Hungarian Jews. You know, it's just crazy stuff. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think that Warburg really only cared about his science. This guy was, really good scientist and you know he was helping Warburg with his experiments but just that that humanity that that I was searching for was, was hard to find uh yeah. you know it's he was a narcissist it's just it was hard for him to escape himself and you know and I'm sure at some moments you know he was better than others but um you know he was not not a lovable guy a funny guy an eccentric and you know he understood it too you know he he said once somebody said I heard you were a terrible uh, human being, but a wonderful scientist. And he said, uh, yes, and I'm glad it wasn't the other way around. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's how he wanted it. Um, but, Imagine living with somebody like that. Oh, my yeah, God. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, um, you know, the interesting thing is that, um, you know, all the stuff that you mentioned, people sort of dismissing him after the war. I do think that's part of the reason he disappeared. People suspected him of collaborating and, I don't think he collaborated, but he, he did stay when he could have probably left in the early 30s. So he deserves some of the blame, certainly for that. But, um, you know, as, as a side note, he, he really didn't think the Nazis would last more than, you know, a year or so, as, as many others thought that as well. Uh, but what was really interesting is I have assumed that, you know, by, you know, recent years that all that animosity towards Warburg was gone, but I actually encountered it directly in this, uh, you know, famous scientist, oh, wow. uh, yeah, Robert uh, Weinberg, who's made you know many important discoveries about cancer and has a a German background. He told me very very openly that um, you know he left, you know, he didn't want to think about Warburg. He resented Warburg for staying in Germany, and this is you know the same person who wrote this you know this huge cancer textbook that left Warburg out. So clearly. Uh, you know, played a role. And, um, you know, even, even in the late 19th, Chi Van Dang, one of these scientists I referenced who sort of brought metabolism back and, and sent, did the synthesis between molecular biology and metabolism, somebody took him aside in the late 90s and said, you know, just so you know, you're stepping into some historical stuff here that could get ugly, you know, just be careful when you talk about Warburg. So it lingered mm -hmm. for decades. But in the end, I think, it was ultimately, you know, the biggest factor in Warburg being forgotten was probably just the shift to a new way of thinking about cancer. But it's, it certainly didn't help that he had a terrible reputation. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I find this absolutely fascinating. I want to talk a bit more, if I can, about the science then. So one of the things in the book I quite like is that you talk about epidemiology and actually how thinking about like, you know, John Snow in, the, in London, 
when it came to looking at the water supply, it was very easy to see through epidemiology and map making where the disease was coming from. However, it didn't actually tell you what cholera was, didn't tell you how it was transported. I know Jon Snow himself said it was miasma in the water. So they had these uh, antiquated concepts of how disease spread. And I find it interesting how epidemiology, just to bring it into the cancer world, has been very, very able to show us certain patterns, hasn't it? And it's been able to show us that, for instance, you said about different communities and different populations move to another country, uh, or for instance, the white population living alongside indigenous communities in parts of the world would develop cancer and that they wouldn't. Um, and I think this is interesting how science has been using epidemiology for a long time to try and explain things. But really, it's people like Warburg who got to the root cause of actually what's happening. So with all that in mind, uh, can you tell us the completion of the story of Warburg as to how his theories came back again with the uh, onc genes and, and how this theory is now coming together about what's the cause of cancer? Uh, what is it in our environment, do you think, that science is showing us is probably one of the biggest causes as to why cancer is the biggest epidemic we've seen in the last well few centuries? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so the way I like to think about it is that there are you know two two ways to study cancer, to think about cancer. We have what's going on inside the cancer cell. Uh, that's what Warburg studied. And we have the epidemiology, what's going on in populations. And so we talked about the epidemiology a little bit before this story that cancer was once a, a rare disease going, you know, relatively rare in the early 19th century and, you know, just continued to grow more and more common. And so, you know, throughout the 20th century, you have these two stories playing out, you know, scientists in the lab making new discoveries about the cancer cell and epidemiologists trying to figure out, you know, what is going on in, in a population that makes cancer more common. And, um, you know, you mentioned some of the evidence for that is, you know, when you have uh, people like, you know, women of Japanese descent in a, living in Japan, breast cancer was quite low. And then, you know, they'd come to the US and their children would have breast cancer rates, you know, the same as, as anybody else. So there's tons of evidence that it's about how we live. And, you know, it's actually, you know, Richard Dahl, the famous British epidemiologist who made tremendous progress in understanding this. He linked smoking to cancer convincingly. Um, and it was actually Richard Dahl. I, you know, I, I see him as a very important figure in my book because, you know, in the 1980s, uh, or in the early, uh, in 1980, late 70s, he begins, uh, he has, you know, sort of a, a commission from the US government to figure out what's causing cancer. And he, you know, studies all the different causes. And it's really interesting is when he gets to diet, he can't quite figure it out. He said it could be anywhere from 30 to 70% of all cancers are driven by diet. Wow. So a lot of variation that 30 to 70. Wow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty striking. Uh, and diet is just so hard to figure out because, you know, as, as Dahl said, smoking was easy. You know, people either smoked or they didn't. And you could see who yeah. got lung cancer and then say, did they smoke or not? But with diet, you know, you have every meal, you have, you know, hundreds of different ingredients in theory. And, um, you know, you can't do controlled experiments where you lock people away. So the epidemiology was a struggle. But what was really striking to me is uh, at almost the exact same moment that the cancer scientists are starting to understand metabolism and rediscover the Warburg effect, this new epidemiology comes out. And for the first time, it looks overwhelmingly clear that obesity is strongly linked to cancer. You know, throughout, you know, going back to the 19th century, this had been one of the leading theories. They called it overnutrition. People had noticed that people that ate more and had more weight were more likely to be cancer. But in modern epidemiology had never been able to show it conclusively and then in, the, in America in particular, you have this huge obesity epidemic and then you can no longer not see it. I mean, the correlations are so strong. So you have two things now in the late 90s, the discovery that people who are overweight are more likely to get cancer and, and the rediscovery that cancer cells overeat. So these two things I think have to be connected. Um, and you would think, you know, that this would be a big story, but you know, the epidemiologists are in one area, the cancer scientists, are in another and they don't necessarily speak to each other. So, you know, a big part of my book is, is sort of connecting the dots. And the biggest connection I tried to make is what's the connection between obesity and, you know, the Warburg effect and the overeating of glucose. And, and that's why, and, and the last part of my book, I became particularly interested in the hormone insulin uh, and the idea that, that hyperinsulinemia may be 
you know, this key factor that can explain a huge portion of cancers. It can certainly, you know, we know that hyperinsulinemia causes obesity, and we know that hyperinsulinemia actually is, is strongly linked to cancer. And, and a lot of the cancer scientists have discovered that the mutations that actually are linked to cancer are actually those that respond to insulin, this PI3K AKT pathway. So the two sort of different parts of cancer science are coming together. And, you know, all the epidemiologists already knew that there was an insulin cancer link, but they didn't have the other part of it, the metabolism part, what's going on inside the cancer cell. And so uh, I tried to weave these two narratives together uh, in the last chapters. And then the very last chapter is if you buy my hypothesis or think it's plausible that, that insulin is explaining the obesity and the, you know, the cancer biology, then you have to, of course, ask what's driving the hyperinsulinemia. And so that's why my book ends with a, a discussion of the sugar uh, problem, which I, I think is is the biggest part of the story. Wow. Mind blown. Um, actually, one thing I say is interesting. I think it's about a quarter of the book left when you'd kind of left Warburg uh, dead. You know, he died and you did yeah. a, a panning out scene, uh, very Hollywood. You know, what would have happened in, in a, if this was a film, which I, I'd it'd be an amazing film, wouldn't it? Let's be honest. Um, and I thought, where's he going to go next? Like, surely this is done. Like, Warburg's dead. I mean, what else is there? But actually, the fact that you spent the last quarter of the book talking about the rest of the story. So you start off 19th century, you go through Warburg and his life and his career, you then go to the end part, I thought it was really interesting. And I just want to talk about that end bit now, because I think there's so much there we can go into. So firstly, I love what you said about the correlation, not causation necessarily, the epidemiology. You know, when you said about they started understanding that smoking caused lung cancer, it was pretty cut and dry. It was straightforward, very easy, but then nobody would say that that was the definition of why smoking causes cancer, just that it's very clear to see that it does. I guess it's then the scientists come along and they look at the cells and they work out exactly the pathways in the cell and, and what's happening there. Um, and I suppose it's a bit like when people say, you know, uh, having more excess weight causes cancer. But like you're saying, actually, those two things have a root cause. And I think that's where you're now applying the science, which is where the science is coming together now, to say that actually not only are the cancer cells ravenous, maybe it's the insulin uh, I suppose, affecting the whole body and the whole person's ravenous. You know, the way that they're eating, the way that they're overeating is completely to do with hyperinsulinemia. And I think that was really a fascinating sort of, you know, it blew my mind. It made me realize, just like you said about metastasis of a cancer and how the mold spreads on the bread, uh, the actual cancers are looking for energy effectively and they're trying to find the latest energy source. And that's a bit like the metastases of a, of a cancer in the body, um, which I just think brings the whole thing. Oh, there's no question there, is there? I just want to say you know, that just that just made complete sense to me. I was like, oh, my goodness. And I think that's why this book's so important to people to realize when you read it. And I, I said at the start of the show, you take a concept which is really complex and you made it understandable to me. It just blew my mind completely. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I um yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that that bread, uh, you know, the yeast spreading on the bread. That was one of the moments when it really sort of all dawned on me. I was watching this talk by uh, Craig Thompson, who is a, a very important cancer scientist. He's now uh, the president and CEO of Memorial Sloan Kettering, one of the top cancer institutes in the world. And he gave this really beautiful uh, demonstration, which I, I would encourage everybody to uh, watch. It's on YouTube. And he just puts up on, on his slide two pieces of bread and it shows a little mold growing. And then he shows you how, you know, a week later there's more mold and then eventually the whole thing's covered in mold. And he says, you know, this is basically what cancer does. You know, a cell gains the ability to overeat and then it eats as much as it can. If it runs out of room near the crust because it can't get enough nutrients, you know, the, uh, n enough nitrogen, another nutrient that cancer cells need, then it metastasizes, it's spread. And, um, you know, there's this fundamental link between the biology of microorganisms in the cancer cell. And Warburg in 1923 said that, you know, the most important thing we've learned is that cancer behaves like a yeast. Uh, you know, there are differences too, but we really, I think, need to see how fundamental this, this eating, this metabolic shift is to cancer. Uh, you know, once a cell, you know, Craig Thompson uses the expression, once a cell gains the ability to get as much glucose as it wants, it, you know, it starts to think now I can do a lot of other things. I'm, you know, I'm no longer in this social arrangement that all the cells in the body have where we're supposed to only eat when hormones tell us to, or when growth factors tell us to, 
now I can eat whenever I want and you know, the rules don't apply to me. So uh, the question is, you know, what gives the cell the imagination to do this? How does it beat the body's rules for, you know, dispensing food and become an overeating cancer cell? And, you know, there's always glucose around, so it can't just be the availability of glucose, but it, I think insulin is really the key factor here. You know, you have these cancer cells that, you know, are microscopic, they're not growing, but, you know, they start to develop more insulin receptors, they get mutations in this pathway that makes them more responsive to insulin. And, you know, you have this interplay of the mutations and the hyperinsulinemia. And, you know, one, once they can get more glucose than the other tissues, it's, you know, it's off to the races. Yeah, amazing. And I think I'm going to use the F word here. I'm very sorry, everyone. But the word fructose is, I think, a, a key part of this, right? Because yeah. the, the, the amount of fructose we're eating has gone up hugely in the last 150 years. Uh, in fact, it's even seen bizarrely by a lot of people as being a healthy thing in fruit to have lots of, which is terrible. And it seems to me, would you agree that that's almost like the smoking gun behind the insulin anemia that we we see such a high high hyper insulin anemia, sorry, happening because of the increase of fructose consumption? Yeah, I, I think that um, fructose, you know, is really what it all comes down to in a way. Uh, you know, just in case some of your listeners aren't familiar with, with some of this science, uh, sugar, the table sugar that we eat is called sucrose. And that has two halves, one half is glucose and one half is fructose. So all carbohydrates break down to glucose, but you know, not all carbohydrates have this fructose component. And in recent, you know, originally they thought the fructose was actually less harmful because it doesn't seem to cause an insulin spike. A lot of it is metabolized in the liver. So it was only in recent decades that scientists started to say like, wait a minute, you know, fructose might be the true villain here because, uh, you know, more re recent research has shown that it, it's uniquely good or uniquely effective at causing the liver uh, to accumulate fat. And you start to see this with high fructose consumption, particularly in liquid form, this rapid development of fat around the internal organs. And that seems to be the true cause of the insulin resistance, then this fat accumulates, then suddenly the cells that normally would respond to insulin aren't responding. You need more and more insulin to overcome this effect. And that hyperinsulinemia, you know, means you suddenly have, you know, 50 times more insulin in your blood than you, you normally would. And, you know, it's, it's doing its job. It's managing to get the glucose into the cells. But meanwhile, you know, not, not every cell is necessarily going to be resistant to that insulin. If you have a, you know, a cell that happens to have, you know, an epithelial cell with another insulin receptor on it, it's not going to be resistant. It's going to be more receptive to the insulin. So the, you can think of it as fructose driving visceral fat, fat inside of and around our cells, that causing insulin resistance and elevated insulin and the insulin causing cancer. Now, What's interesting to me is that, you know, people, you know, this is still relatively new science and, you know, controversial, but when people say sugar doesn't cause cancer, these are the same people that would happily agree that cancer is strongly linked to obesity. And they would also happily agree that sugar drives obesity. So you don't have to even buy any of these sort of nuances to just see sugar, obesity, obesity, cancer. Uh, I think the, you know, the insulin stuff is fascinating and can explain all these connections. But I think that the story is pretty clear. And, you know, they've already definitively linked 13 cancers to obesity. I think the number is greater in that, um, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, this 30% versus 70% that Richard Dahl identified. I think the more we learn about obesity and metabolic syndrome, the more we're going to see it shift towards the 70 because it's not just the obviously obese people. You know, there's millions and millions of people that look thin but actually have some of this metabolic syndrome as well. Or Tofi or they have other signs. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Okay. As we come to the end of our uh, hour together, and I must admit, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, if anyone's got yeah, any comments to leave, if you're watching this live now, please leave your comments and we'll, we'll go through some of those shortly as well. Um, but I've got some last questions I would like to ask you, really. Um, firstly, wh what was it that made you study this area? Was it, was it Wilberg, you were interested in as a person or were you interested you know, in cancer? What has it brought you to this topic? And then as part of that question, what is it that you discovered or you learned that you didn't know previously? 
Sure. Uh, I was interested in metabolism uh, even before, you know, I, I started writing this book. I was interested in obesity and diet. And, you know, I'd read uh, Gary Taubes in particular, had uh, sort of opened my eyes to some of this stuff. And, you know, I, as a journalist, it just seemed like an incredible story. Like, can it possibly be true that, you know, that all this information that uh, I've been given throughout my life could be incorrect? You know, I grew up eating pasta, drinking skim milk, you know, trying to avoid fat as much as possible. So, uh, you know, I, I was curious you know, and, and amazed uh, that, you know, all this science might not be correct. But, you know, even even in studying that, I hadn't really thought about cancer as being a metabolic disease. I had thought about obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. So, so when I saw that it was, you know, potentially linked to cancer and that if you look, you know, in the early 19th century going to today, that cancer moves in lockstep with diabetes and obesity growing more and more common, uh, that that really fascinated me because I, I didn't think it was part of this story. And then, you know, as I was reading about it, I saw just one sentence about Warburg, and then I Googled him and started to read about his background. And, and that's when I knew I wanted to write more because, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm a, I'm a storyteller, and I don't know really how to tell a story unless I have a character. And uh, I never, you know, I knew I wasn't going to find a better character than Warburg. So. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I put him at the center of my story. I, in theory, I could have done it with other researchers, but since he made the most the fundamental discovery and his life sort of spanned this period that I was interested in, uh, it just made sense to do it that way. But it, it was, as a writer, very challenging to, to figure out how to structure it because, it, as you referenced, the end of the book continues beyond his life. So suddenly I had to figure out, like, how am I going to do this? His life is over, but I still have more I want to say. So that, that was one of the big challenges. Yeah, and actually, this is what I think is really interesting. I think Nina Teicholz does the same thing, you know, and Gary Tobbs, to be fair. You know, I guess a scientist might be very, very knowledgeable about their area and how it fits into the big picture. You're coming as a complete outsider. So not only do you have to explain to somebody like me who didn't know about it either, you have to learn it to such a level that you can then make a story. That's an incredible amount of research. I mean, how long did it take you to, to write this book? Well, it took five years to write it. And uh, yeah. I had spent the previous year working on a magazine article, which sort of led to the book. So really about six years. Um, and yeah, it, it took an incredible amount of research, but I, I do, you know, I, I half jokingly say that I, I have the advantage over scientists of not understanding everything. Uh, you know, when you understand every last molecular detail in the way some scientists do it, it makes it more challenging to sort of tell the story because you're so deep in the weeds. And I hope I understand it thoroughly, but it is an advantage to not have, you know, a complete hundred percent, you know, depth of knowledge the way some people do yeah okay so i, had a, I said i had a couple of questions the next one is is a bit more i suppose about you know your how did you experience studying this story and do you mind me saying you know as a jewish person uh, and of course you know i imagine you'd have to go into this yourself i'm sure but i imagine the nazis had a huge impact in family relations in the past as well so what was it like studying it from another sort of point of view with somebody who even though he disliked the nazis coexisted co alongside them and was pre protected by them as well. Did you have any personal feeling towards that at all? Um, yeah, I mean, I've written about the Holocaust and the Nazi period before, and, you know, it, it's always difficult to, to some extent. And it was, you know, with Warburg, you know, I, I came to sort of, you know, forgive him, if you will, for staying in, in Nazi Germany because... I think he misunderstood and it's just, you know, he was, you know, so fundamentally, you know, sort of arrogant and blind to everything else going around him that um, I don't think he could have left. Yeah, uh, there was this line from Einstein in which he says, you know, the hardest part about the Nazi period for some people was understanding they had been wrong about Germany, you know, and Warburg couldn't accept that he was wrong about anything. So. I, I was able to deal with that, but, but it was really hard and, you know, the hardest moment for me in terms of feeling like I could still, you know, I wanted to like the subject of my book and, you know, I don't think I have to like or dislike him, but, you know, he's a complicated hero, but, you know, I think the biggest black record on his name is that, um, you know, he wrote after the war, he wrote a statement saying that, you know, this horrible Nazi, Victor Brack, had helped him. And he didn't, you know, I spoke with other historians and looked into this, and it looks like he didn't know that Brack was responsible for these horrific crimes when he gave the statement. And it's true that Brack saved his life. 
but you know, just you know, someone who you know, so you know, lost relatives, of course, like all Jewish people in the Holocaust, and are so horrified, uh, you know, by the every aspect of the Nazi period to find that, you know, this man that I'm writing a book about made a statement on behalf of one of the worst Nazis. It was really difficult. And, you know, that, that was something I, I struggled with when I discovered that. And I felt like I really had to get to the, to the bottom of that and to, to see if he understood what he was doing. And I don't think he did, but um, it was definitely a dark moment in the Warburg saga. Yeah. And it's just, you know, some of those names you're talking about, uh, you know, did you say it was, um, uh, who was having the conversation with Hitler the night before Barbarossa? Was it Goebbels? With the, uh, with Goebbels him? was having it, but but Victor Brock, who met with Warburg, also had a uh, a conversation with Himmler. If you look in Himmler's, he has a, a diary book where it shows what he talked about in every conversation. So if you look in the diary book, you know, June 21st, 1941, meeting with Brock to discuss how to Warburg. Incredible. And it's and you actually said in the book as well, Barbarossa was actually named Otto before, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The irony of that. But you think, yeah. you know, these are some of the biggest war cri criminals ever known to human history. And yet they're they're conversing with him or they were protect. It's just incredible. And you think that, isn't it? Just, yeah, you know, like it's just horrifying to know. Uh, but then I guess, did he know? That's the question. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. I don't I don't think he knew. But, you know, it's still. You know, and at some point by the late 30s, you know, he had to do whatever he could to to try to remain alive. And another thing that, you know, is uncomfortable for me, you know, looking at it from a Jewish perspective is he applied for Aryanization, which uh, yes. meant that his status as a half Jew would be upgraded. So he would be considered a true Aryan. And I don't think he, you know, by that point in the war, tens of thousands of these half and quarter Jews were doing this because, you know, it was a way to survive in, in Nazi Germany at the time and to be able to continue your life. So I, I think that um, he should be, you know, quote unquote, forgiven for that. But, um, you know, it's certainly uncomfortable. You know, his student Hans Krebs, uh, you know, clearly loved Warburg to the end of his life, but, you know, nevertheless said that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of Jewish people disliked Warburg because he tried to, you know, sell his soul and, you know, whitewash his Jewish past by applying for Aryanization. But, you know, from the Jewish perspective, probably the most uncomfortable part of, of writing this book was seeing that the, the Nazis really did make progress on cancer scientists, uh, on cancer science. You know, you never yeah. want to say the Nazis did anything good. And, you know, I think they were motivated for all the wrong reasons. And you talked about that a little before as well. But, um, you know, they inherited a, a very remarkable uh, science establishment and they were focused on cancer and, and they did you know, actually 20 years before Richard Dahl had made the link between smoking and cancer, you know, Nazi researchers had made that link. So they really did make progress on cancer scientists, even if it was, you know, through the darkest ideology possible. Yeah, definitely. So, Sam, um, I feel really like I do you a massive disservice by taking six years of work, which has produced this incredible book, and trying to distill that into one hour. So uh, before I ask the, the last part, is there anything else you wanted to say about Warburg, about his career, or about cancer generally? Uh, or maybe what can people go and look at next as a good place to learn more about this topic? Um, sure. Well, um you know, I, I encourage people to uh, look at the research of Lewis Cantley. He was one of the researchers who influenced me. He's at Weill Cornell Medicine. And you can find some of his papers and videos online. You know, he's not on social media. Um, but, you know, the takeaway for me is, you know, it's not a prescriptive book. I don't tell people how to eat. But if you follow the logic of the book, you know, I'm focused on cancer prevention and you know, if, if this hypothesis about insulin is right and sugar is right, then, you know, takeaway is that, you know, for prevention purposes, you want to try to follow a diet that will keep your insulin lower. And, you know, ketogenic diet is low carb diet is one, one good way to do that. Um, and I think people just really need to, you know, recognize that, you know, the science, we need more science, not everything's complete, but that, um, if you think about elevated insulin as a carcinogen, you know, if we had anything else that was that strongly linked to cancer in our environment, you know, there would be huge labels on it. We'd run away from it and, uh, you know, it would be like a national emergency, but it's in our own blood. And so we don't think about it in that way. But I think we have to think of insulin as a carcinogen and to be more afraid of it. You know, it can't explain every cancer and there are no guarantees in, in cancer, even if you do everything right. But 
I think, you know, we can do so much more in terms of prevention. And it's this 50th anniversary of America's, you know, quote unquote, war on cancer. So I just think it's, it's a good moment to, um, you know, to start thinking about prevention in this new way. And, you know, as it happens that if you lower your insulin through diet, you know, you'll make your cancer odds a little bit better, but you'll also probably improve your health in a hundred other ways as well. So, you know, it's a, an added bonus that, that doing something good for prevention is, you know, fundamentally important for so many different chronic diseases. Amazing. Thank you. And um, I just want to say, uh, you, I'm sure you've got other books in you to come yet. What, what are you thinking in regards to your next project? Are you working on it already? Are you thinking about uh, another book in science and that, that sort of topic? Yeah, I'm, I'm not working on it yet. And I'm still in a sort of recovery mode from, from all this work. But, um, you know, I, I'm not positive that I'm going to do another book in this area. But I have been thinking about writing about this uh, Arctic explorer, Stephenson, who uh, made a lot of interesting discoveries and has, you know, dramatic stories of his polar expo- expedition. So, uh, you know, he was kind of one of the first low carb people in the 20th century. So, well, it'll be interesting to, uh, to look into that, but I- I'm just not sure yet. Well, I'll definitely reserve a copy if uh, if that's coming out. Uh, I just want to say, before I say thank you to you, thank you to Professor Tim Noakes for recommending uh, the book Ravenous to me. Uh, and then, you know, that's kind of made this happen today. So thank you for that. Yeah, uh, and a I, I want to oh, sorry, go Tim for Noak- oh, I, I, I've noticed, you know, Tim Noakes has, has been a, a really great supporter online and tweeted about the book. And so I, I'm really grateful for that as well. Yeah, he's a great guy, and he's, um, you know, he obviously saw a massive value in your book, and and he's spreading the world, which is word, which is fantastic. Um, and how can people connect with you, Sam? Uh, are you on Twitter mostly? Sure. Yeah, mostly on Twitter. Uh, too much on Twitter lately. Um, at Sam underscore Apple One uh, is my Twitter handle, and then uh, the website is samapple.com. And yeah, that's basically it. Great. Well, thank you so much today for coming on UK Low Carb, Sam. It's been brilliant meeting you and talking in a bit of detail. There's so much I wanted to ask you, but I just want to say a massive thank you for today and a thank you for your book, uh, Ravenous. If you want to get a copy, I just want to say this is what it looks like, everyone. So go and get your copy. Uh, I guess it's on Amazon. It's everywhere, this book. You can get the audio book, which is what I also read as well. And I've also got the paperback, oh, sorry, the hardback here as well. Go check it out. I definitely recommend it. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming on the show. And uh, I wish you a very nice afternoon, whatever you're up to. It's in the morning in the States, still, isn't it? So yeah, have a, yeah. have a great, your day's about to start. There you go. You're lucky. Uh, so have a great day. All right. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much. Cheers, Sam. Bye.